Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of David Ferry, Archivist of the United States, I'd like to welcome you to the McGowan Theater located in the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C. Mr. Ferriero was planning to make the welcoming remarks today, but he was called to Baltimore on urgent business. As many of you know, I'm Doug Swanson. I'm the Visitor Services Manager and the producer for the uh, public uh, noontime lecture series, excuse me. Before we bring out today's speaker, Hendrik Hartog, I'd like to tell you about two other programs that are coming up uh, later this month. On Thursday, April 19th at 7 p.m., we'll host the 11th Annual McGowan Forum on Women in Leadership, Women in Foreign Services. A panel of leaders in the diplomatic field will discuss their experiences, explore critical viewpoints, and offer advice to young women entering the field of American Foreign Service. The following week on Thursday, April 26th at 7 p.m., our program Remembering Vietnam, Medics, Corpsmen, and Nurses will feature a panel of Viet uh, Vietnam veterans and historians who will recount their experiences and explain the duties of medical personnel in Vietnam. To learn more about these and all of our other programs and our exhibits, uh, please consult our monthly calendar of events, which you can find online at www.archives.gov calendar. You'll also find some printed materials uh, about our programs out in the theater lobby. Another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports the work of the agency, especially its education and outreach programs. So you can pick up an application for membership in the lobby, or you can become a member online at archivesfoundation.org. When thinking of slavery and emancipation in the United States, certain assumptions spring to mind. Our first thoughts are probably of the Civil War, the years immediately surrounding it, and the states of the Confederacy. Further consideration brings up the Underground Railroad, the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, and the Freedmen's Bureau. Hendrik Hartog's new book, The Trouble with Minna, takes us to an unexpected time and place, New Jersey in 1840, in a period of gradual emancipation in the northern states, the concepts of freedom, rights, and responsibilities were examined and debated. One court case led Professor Hartog to more fully examine the world in which these people involved lived, an unfamiliar world to us, in which slavery and freedom were not neatly defined. The documentary record, whether here in the National Archives, in state archives, or in local repositories, makes unfamiliar, unfamiliar worlds known to us. We often speak of digging through records and unearthing documents as if the researcher were on, were on an archaeological expedition. The historian working in an archive is an explorer, reminding us that there are always new stories to learn and new facets to stories we thought we were already told. And now I'm going to turn over our lecture today to our guest author. Hendrik Hartog is the class of 1921 bicentennial professor in the history of American law and liberty at Princeton University and a former director of the university's program in American studies. Before coming to Princeton, he taught in the law schools of the University of Wisconsin and Indiana University. Hartog has spent his scholarly and teaching life working in the social history of American law, studying how broad political and cultural themes have been expressed in ordinary legal conflicts. He has worked in a variety of areas of American legal history as it affects city life, constitutional rights, claims, marriage, and inheritance, and old age, as well as the historiography of legal change. He is the author of Public Property and Private Power, the Corporation of the City of New York in American Law, 1730 to 1870, Man and Wife in America, a history which was cited in the uh, majority opinion in Obergefeld versus Hodges, where the U.S. Supreme Court recognized same-sex marriage as a constitutional right. And someday, all this will be yours, a history of inheritance and old age. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hendrik Hartog to the National Archives. Thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you, Doug, for, for arranging this visit. Um, the book is actually, you know, like two weeks from actually coming out. So I, this is the first time I've actually spoken about it. So 
you know, forgive me if it doesn't, you know, I'm working out the kinks. <laughs> um, I thought of using this time to tell you about several of the stories that lie at the heart of this peculiar book about a small site in the United States. They're good stories. I, I want to emphasize that I really found wonderful stories about arson and escapes, about abandonment and care, about kidnappings and poor relief and family reconstructions. And those stories allowed me to begin to see the features of an odd but curiously familiar world, one in which my actors, white and black, legally trained and illiterate, constantly and for the most part competently negotiated contradictory norms and rules, both with one another and with the agents of that peculiar state, New Jersey. But I didn't want to suck you into too many weed fields. And for those of you who will, I hope, want to read the book, it is short and I think it's accessible. The weeds are fragrant and they're pretty nutritious. I don't want to rob you of the surprises that these stories hold. So instead, let me say a little bit about how this book came to be, about what some of the historiographical stakes were for me and what I found. Then I thought I would read a bit about it a couple of events in the legal life of one of my central actors, Joseph Hornblower, who was the Chief Justice for 20 years of the New Jersey Supreme Court. Finally, I'll do a quick riff drawn from my introduction about the significance of contract and contract law in the world of gradual emancipation, which, which sounds like a contradiction in terms. How can there be contract law in a realm of where there's slavery? But I'll try and explain that. That latter part is especially for the lawyers and the lawyerish in the room. I assume there are some there. OK, so part one. There's three parts to this talk. Part one, I wrote this book to answer questions or mysteries that I couldn't let go of. Or to put it differently, it emerged out of a series of accidents or fortunate conjunctures. One story led to another and to another. And although this book is framed around one central story, about Minna, the content and meanings of that story are shaped by hundreds of other stories found as I traced a variety of leads. As Doug said, uh, the, the archives sort of suck you in and you keep you going. Um, meanwhile, the answers to the mysteries I found and explored about New Jersey and gradual emancipation, among other things, still remain mysterious to me and incomplete. OK, so the beginning is actually my prior book about inheritance. I was researching and writing a book about care within middling, mostly white families. There was a phrase I kept finding in the cases I was using as my primary sources. Whenever a court wanted to deny compensation for what some young person had done to care for an older relative, it would declare that the actions constituted a mere voluntary courtesy. Even if a daughter or a niece had spent years cleaning bedpans and doing all the work that came with the care of a demented old person, when she finally sued for some compensation, she might be turned down by a judge who mobilized that phrase, a mere voluntary courtesy. Where did that phrase come from? Weirdly enough, when I looked, I discovered it came from this 1840 New Jersey case, Force v. Haynes, about an older white woman who sued the apparent master of an apparently enslaved black woman to recover the costs of the enslaved woman's care. The enslaved woman had once been the least property of the older white woman. This is all a really dark story, and I want to apologize for that, but that's you know, that's history. Um, as almost always is the case, there was actually a longer history to the phrase reaching back to a 17th century English case about a man seeking a pardon for his conviction for murder. But that's another story, and let me leave that aside. Anyway, finding Force v. Haynes and Justice Ford's elaborate opinion about what made the care of the apparently enslaved Minna a mere voluntary courtesy introduced me to the world of slavery in New Jersey. Care was part of the story, 
But between reading Ford's and the other concurring or dissenting opinions by the justices of the New Jersey Supreme Court, I found myself absorbed by the questions that New Jersey slavery raised for me. In those opinions, they argued over the meaning and the moral significance of the law of slavery, all to explain why Mrs. Haynes, the white woman, couldn't get compens the compensation she had asked for. What were they arguing about at a time when the number of slaves in New Jersey was already minuscule? Those opinions led me to ask what was gradual emancipation in the North? New Jersey, not a representative state, but less different from other northern states than one might think, or than some historians have claimed, had enacted a gradual emancipation law in 1804. What that meant was that the children of enslaved people from then on would become free when or if they reached the age of 21 if female or 25 if male, basically taking an enormous amount of their labor over the course of, for their lives before their freedom came about. Although the number of enslaved people in the state declined steadily from then on so that by 1840, at the time that Force v. Haynes was decided, there were around 600 slaves or enslaved people left in the state. As late as the Civil War, there were still a few women and men who were effectively enslaved in New Jersey. New Jersey still had slaves at the time of the Civil War. Although by then the state identified them as quote unquote, apprentices for life. It's a there is a recent literature about slavery in the North which emphasizes how long emancipation took, why it was that apparently free states remained slave states well into the 19th century. This recent literature reacts to and challenges an older historiography that celebrated the creation of the free North after the American Revolution. My questions and the material that I was reading led me into an approach that was different than those that characterized either of those two literatures. I became absorbed by the question, and that's really what the book is about, um, what it meant that people, white and black, continued to live within a regime of gradual emancipation for the better part of two generations over a period roughly as long as the period from the end of World War II to the present day. So, I mean, it's really a very long period that they lived within a world that was called gradual emancipation. What were the legal terms that shaped their ongoing relationships and their evolving understandings? How did gradual emancipation evolve legally? I became interested in what gradual emancipation was other than as a lead up to an ending. I began to see gradual emancipation as a regime, as a chaotic and contradictory, but recognizable state system of legal and governmental rules and practices. Boundaries, both physical and conceptual boundaries were constantly being crossed, including the boundaries that separated New Jersey law from the laws of other states, particularly that of New York. But boundaries are crossed in every legal regime. Gradual emancipation was more than a transition. It was a way of being a legal regime. So I dived into this legal regime, the law of New Jersey, bracketing off the question whether it was really a free state or really a slave state. Indeed, I came to see gradual emancipation as necessarily both. As I mentioned, I found many good stories along the way. There was pervasive contracting between masters and their enslaved people. I'll something, say something more about that in a minute. Um, yet some of the contracting had the ironic effect of preserving the institution of slavery even as the usual effects of contracting were in the end to turn enslaved peoples into free peoples. But the in the end, in any case, would often be a very, very long time. And the New Jersey regime was enmeshed with uncertain relationships, with poor relief, with other forms of labor relations, with uncertainties about the jurisdiction of New Jersey courts over particular individuals who might or might not belong to the state, with deep uncertainties about what was the law. 
As such, I came to see what I was doing as a challenge to what might be called the neo-abolitionism that shapes our own constitutional consciousness and culture as American citizens. What do I mean by that? Um, I mean that I work to think outside of a conventional wisdom, one that I, like most Americans, share today. Um, I came to see that our understanding of the relationship between slavery and freedom, one that is fixed in our lives by the Reconstruction Amendments, that is the 13th and 14th Amendments, can blinker us to previous historical understandings, to the world that free people and enslaved people led um, in the first half of the 19th century. The meaning of freedom, our understanding of freedom, one that is deeply imbricated in our constitutional culture, one that is instantiated and made manifest by the 13th Amendment, one that draws on both anti-slavery, abolitionist thinking, and late antebellum pro-slavery thought, as well as the um, in intense work of escaped slaves themselves, um, begins with the truth that slavery and freedom exist in a kind of antinomic relationship to each other, in opposition to one another. One is free or one is enslaved. We live in a world of slavery or we live in a world of freedom. To understand freedom is to understand not um, it, to understand freedom is to understand not slavery, emblazoned in the 13th Amendment's notion of ending the badges and incidents of slavery, just as slavery is the antithesis of the terms of life in the free world. And yet throughout most of human history, at least up to the Civil War, slavery did not end with an exemplary and absolutist act. Indeed, unless one imagines the Union Army as the actor, it may never have ended in that way, even with the passage of the 13th Amendment. Throughout most of modern history, putting aside the Haitian Revolution, which is an important putting aside, um, including the end of slavery in New Jersey, slavery's end was always experienced as gradual and incomplete, as about systems of compensations and about transitions, about family relations, and about the management and the costs of dependency. Often, as in New Jersey, it became governmentally a question of taxation. In that sense, the trouble with Minna explores the excluded middle that our constitutional conventional wisdom makes invisible today. It is, to use a phrase that I draw from the title of my mentor Willard Hurst's most famous book, about law and the conditions of freedom. But ironically or paradoxically, it is about conditions of freedom that existed in a world of gradual abolition, where people lived lives, sometimes long lives, in a space and an era where freedom and slavery coexisted. As such, it may have something to teach us about the conditions that shape our lives as well today. OK, that's part one. Part two. What were the terms of that world? How were lives lived within the regime? Obviously, the book is my answer, but here is a taste. Consider the early legal life of Joseph Hornblower, the Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court, and one of the two judges who dissented in Force v. Haynes. After his death in 1862, all his biographers and memorialists celebrated his anti-slavery credentials. He had, they said, always been an anti-slavery man who did his best to extinguish the last remnants of the slavery institution which lingered in some portions of his state. In 1836, he had challenged the enforceability in New Jersey of the Federal Fugitive Slave Act. In 1844, as a member of the Constitutional Convention, he argued strenuously but unsuccessfully for an absolute abolition of slavery. In 1845, in one of the first decisions under that constitution, he argued that the opening constitutional statement of rights in that document made slavery an impossibility. Once again, he argued as a dissenter without success. In 1857, as an old man, he wrote a young admirer that he despaired for his country because of the power that slaveholders wielded nationally. Earlier, however, as a family member and as a young lawyer, he had lived and practiced law 
within New Jersey's regime of slavery and very gradual emancipation. How comfortably he lived within that regime, it's impossible to say. But we have to assume that he managed to reconcile his work life and his household and family life with his principles, even as he maintained his membership in manumission, in freedom societies. He knew how to be a slaveholder, at least a New Jersey slaveholder, and he understood and worked within the terms of New Jersey law. In 1823, he and his siblings manumitted a slave, Sarah, identified as having been their father's slave. Josiah Hornblower, Joseph's father, had died in 1809, 14 years earlier. After his death, the inventory to his estate, for which Joseph served as executor, had included five enslaved people, two men each worth $200, one man worth $120, a Negro girl worth $50, and a second girl named Sal, who was worth only $20. I suspect, I don't know, that Sal was the same woman that Joseph Hornblower and his brothers manumitted 40, 14 years later as Sarah. But where had she lived between Josiah's death and her manumission? It's very possible that she had lived in Joseph Hornblower's house. In his will, to give a little more detail of the world that we're talking about, Josiah Hornblower who had himself been a controversial engineer and inventor, had instructed his executors that he wished his slave Betty to be freed if she obtained the necessary security for legal manumission. Betty did not appear in the inventory to his estate, either because Josiah's instructions removed her or because she was of no marketable value due to her age. She was probably over 40, which is why her manumission was premised on payment of security to protect the town's overseers of the poor from responsibility. If she could not find such security, she would, according to Josiah's will, be free to choose her own master and should be sold for a reasonable compensation. It's, of course, significant that Josiah did not suggest or dictate that his executors should pay for her security and we know nothing about how Josiah expected that Betty would find the resources to buy her own freedom. Since Betty's name doesn't appear with or without security in the Essex County Manumission book, it's likely that she found a new master for herself. One is left to wonder whom she chose and how she made that decision. And also, what, if anything, the estate received from the master she chose. In 1817 and 1818, Joseph Hornblower, the abolitionist, anti-slavery man who lived in Newark, manumitted his own slaves, a woman, Molly, and a man, Benjamin. Obviously, those acts require us to conclude that up until that point, well into his adulthood, he had kept slaves in his own household. Joseph Hornblower had been a successful lawyer for a quarter century by the time he became the Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. Indeed, in his biographical survey of New Jersey judges, Lucius Elmer argued that Hornblower had, been, Blower had been a better lawyer than a judge, that his temperament was better suited to advocacy. Like most successful lawyers of the time, his practice was a combination of trial advocacy and office counseling. In 1813, one of Hornblower's clients was Anne Ogilvie. Her father, Alexander McWhorter, had been a famous minister in Elizabethtown in South Carolina. McWhorter had died in 1807, and Anne was his executor. Hornblower had been hired to help her settle her father's estate and work through other matters. Early on, that involved dealing with the death of Katie, Anne Ogilvie's black woman, because that's the, how the, she's identified. A letter from Ogilvy noted that Katie's death agitated and affected her exceedingly. It was the loss of someone who had acted a conspicuous part among my beloved father's household, and it brought tender remembrances into view. By 1813, Katie evidently lived on her own under the hill, apart from Ogilvy, although apparently not freed. With her death, rent was still owed, and her clothing and chests and her bed, bedstead, and rubbish had to be removed and sold. 
Would Hornblower deal with all that? This is the sort of thing a lawyer gets asked to do. Since Ogilvy was just a fatherless, brotherless, childless widow, this is how she identifies herself, who looked to the sympathy and kindness in his heart. Hornblower noted on the back of the letter that he had spent $20 on Ogilvy's behalf, including $2.25 for Katie's remaining rent and $6 for a coffin. In December 1813, Samuel Beebe of New York City, a grandson of McWhorter and a nephew of Anne Ogilvy, sent attorney Hornblower a note. A black girl, this is how he's identified, who had once belonged to his grandfather had called on him because she had been told that Hornblower intended to have her sold as part of his management of the McWhorter estate. Beebe wanted Hornblower to know that that was not possible Anne Ogilvy had given the black girl called Leah or Elsie to his sister Mary, who lived with their parents in New York City. According to Beebe, she had spent several years in the Beebe household, but recently Mary Beebe, the, uh, the, uh, the, the granddaughter who had received her, had told her that if she thought she could procure a living, she might leave her and be free. As a result, according to Beebe, Leah or Elsie could not be sold because she was no longer a slave. Beebe hoped that Hornblower would drop him a line on the subject. If Hornblower did respond, the letter has been lost, or I haven't found it. And the next we hear of Leah or Elsie is more than eight years later, in January 1822. Hornblower received a letter from Theodorus Bailey, a New York attorney, who enclosed an opinion letter from another New York attorney, the eminent Josiah Ogden Hoffman, with regard to the status of a female slave of the late Dr. McWhorter. The costs of her care, usually referred to as maintenance, were being litigated between the overseers of the poor of the township of Newark, New Jersey, and the McWhorter estate. Evidently, Leah or Elsie had moved to Newark after Mary Beebe had released her from service. She had become a pauper and applied for poor relief. Under New Jersey law, as expressed in a 1798 slave code, a slave owner might remain liable or responsible for the care of his now or her now dependent slave, even after having manumitted or freed the slave. Such continued liability might apply if the manumission had occurred through private contract or deed or by testamentary gift. It looks like Hornblower had written to Bailey to ask him to solicit Hoffman's advice about the legal status of a slave like Leah or Elsie under New York law. Hornblower was uncertain whether New York or New Jersey law applied. And there's then lots of back and forth um, he, he basically s sends all of this information to the um, Newark overseers of the poor who were unconvinced. And, you know, the story continues about, you know, is Leah or Elsie properly manumitted or not properly manumitted? Um, and how are we supposed to know? And it's the part of the problem is New York law or New Jersey law um, goes back and forth. The story goes on and has lots of details, but let me stop with that. Um, and just because you have gotten enough of, a, enough of the weeds for one, for, for one day. Um, OK, part three. And then I want to hope I can take your questions and thoughts, which I'd love to hear. Um, this is throughout a study of contractual behavior. Uh, to talk legalish for just a moment. Um, one might describe this as a book about questions regarding the law of consideration, as it would have been understood in the legal culture of the early 19th century. Through the lens of care and enslavement explores how particular acts, expressions, and transactions did or did not produce legally enforceable duties and obligations, and how other acts, expressions, and transactions became the consideration for an enforceable contract. The reader's attention will be drawn to agreements and bargains suggested and implied and challenged. Um, it's not only the usual stuff of contract law, but also a range of writings that become something like contracts because they attempted to fix relationships in time. Um, I spent a lot of pages on a tiny piece of paper that one apparently enslaved person 
holds on to after his master has convinced him to burn down the house so that the master can get the insurance proceeds. But, um, and probably the, the enslaved person would have spent his life in prison or be hung, except for the fact that he had this piece of paper. And in the end, the insurance company will use that to defeat the, cl the insurance claims of the owner. It's a, it's a pretty good story. <laughs> um, it's, um, but these, there, there's lots of contracts all through my, what I'm writing about, um, be, and they all try to fix relationships in time. To take one recurrent example, consider the provisions in many wills. Uh, you saw some in the wills, the will of the father of Joseph Hornblower that promised to free or manumit an enslaved person at the end of something like a fixed term. Or to take another example that will be explored in chapter three, the writing coercively imposed by a ferry owner on his free black employee to recreate a condition of slavery, at least for a limited term. Or to take a third example, the fraudulently but apparently free quote unquote consent which after 1812 was required of enslaved people who their masters wanted to move to Louisiana to the sugar plantations. And in theory, the law required them to give their free consent. Now, you know, one should assume this is totally fraudulent because no sane human being would have ever have agreed to, to be moved to the, to the sugar plantations of Louisiana. But you can see pages after pages of these so-called free consents uh, that were produced in what, what was later labeled a kind of kidnapping controversy. Such writings were constitutive of a contractual world even when mobilized to reproduce the material conditions we and they identify with chattel slavery. Usually they expressed a slaveholder's power. And yet many of them also extended a present relationship into a defined and bounded future as contracts between free individuals were expected to do. They produced what poet and scholar of the ancient world Anne Carson calls a now. Each represented a limited but real effort to control the future, to thrust a present relationship, a now, into the future. Each carried the implication that the relationship in question, even one called slavery, would come to an end at the conclusion of the contracted four term, a fixed and finite period of time. And once the contract was executed, everyone, including the apparently enslaved, could walk away. Such writings, deeds, wills, bills of pay, sale, and scraps of paper, along with the legal arguments over their meanings, produce much of the documentary record that underlies this study. I've struggled to interpret conflicted meaning in the contractual language and in legal arguments and trial testimony in order to reconstruct the terms of the New Jersey slave regime and determine what gradual abolition meant in practice for the enslaved as well as for slaveholders and the communities that surrounded them. My goal, as it is with for many historians, is to reveal how lives were lived within those relationships in order to gain and share a fleeting insight into those people's present tense, their, their now. For many abolitionists, southern slaveholders and historians alike, slavery has implicitly meant a denial of the fugitive and fleeting but delimited now of contract. Instead, the law of slavery was said to be founded on the belief that a property law writing, a deed, for example, could fix an identity in perpetuity. Indeed, our confident sense today of the moral illegitimacy of chattel slavery, which we learned from abolitionists, among others, is enmeshed with its apparent denial of the boundaries that contractualism offered. That is much of what is captured by the familiar trope, which we all know that slavery privileged property and denied personhood. And it was a standard understanding throughout the Deep South that contracting was inconsistent with the condition of being enslaved. By contrast, 
Between the early 19th century and the 1840s, one finds negotiated and temporally bounded slave relationships throughout New Jersey. These were relationships that incorporated a particularized and fleeting now, a temporality that one ordinarily identifies with contractual freedom. As late as the 1840s, New Jersey continued to allow a few white men and women to know themselves as slaveholders. At the same time, 1840s New Jersey had a legal culture shaped by contractualism and ubiquitous contracting. That's the paradox at the heart of this study. I can read you more, but I think I'll stop and see if you can take your questions, because that's probably a better idea, and there's probably more to be said. I would learn more from you all then. So thank you very much. OK? I could keep reading. But I'm and I think I've been told that you should ask questions at the, from those. Please, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I got to admit, I was a bit confused at different points through your uh, descriptions. Oh, um, but uh, my question has to do with the idea of private property slavery and the rights of people who are in debt to hold themselves as collateral for their debt, which was a form of, by which people went into slavery for many hundreds of years. Yeah. And it occurs to me that somehow or other in this idea of contracts between people and then eventual emancipation as an, amend as an amendment of the Constitution, that uh, that amendment is actually taking away some right to private property. Absolutely. The 13th Amendment is the greatest taking of private property, maybe in human history. We should celebrate it for that. But it, um, it is um, unlike almost every other um, abolition, for example, in uh, Britain, in, the, for, in its Caribbean colonies, um, even Haiti, eventually, the reason Haiti has been so impoverished for so long is eventually it has to comp compensate France for the loss of uh, oh. property. Um, eventually, after, you know, it, 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 but, um, you know, it, the 13th Amendment wouldn't happen without war and without the fact that you had, that you were basically taking the property of traitors uh, to the Union. Um, but um, it's definitely, you know, it, it, it is an ab absolute um, taking. Actually, what I was concerned with was the right of a person to consider his own private property of himself as something he could give away by contract. Well, there is certainly, out of um, black freedom uh, literatures as well as abolitionist literature, the idea of self-ownership is a central theme that comes out of our history of abolitionism and our, the struggle over slavery. Um, and many historians, Amy Drew Stanley and others, have written wonderfully about what, how, what that meant. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, I want to thank you very much for this, uh, this, uh, this talk. Um, I'm from the Caribbean. Okay. And um, I'm happy to see that uh, you kind of uh, is dealing with the fact that of how much the Caribbean has been quite um, important in uh, the whole slavery development in the United States and even the, the, the unfolding of slavery in the United States. But um, one of the issues that I think you are struggling with here, and I think that is quite important, is uh, the very notion of how um, how this um, whole issue of slavery and its unfolding um, has defined, in essence, the position of black in the United States up to today, right? Yes. How it, it continues basically to hunt their very position in the United States up to today. I mean, we just have to look at the way uh, police deal with, with blacks in the United States, the shooting, the ongoing shootings of black people in the United States, and how very few policemen are held responsible for that at the end of the day. Right. So I was wondering if you were 
if you have ever considered um, how um, the different positions of black in the southern part of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the position of blacks in, United States, in the northern part of the United States, how this polarized, vexed, differentiating, but also gradual changing, how that situation has continued to hunt um, the position of blacks in the United States and how it has made it uh, very difficult for blacks to be able, enslave black people in the United States to be able to, to find real freedom, real kind of what lawyers would call a kind of a material freedom in the United States. I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were uh, about I mean, that I, difficult I, question. I mean, it, you know, in a sense, there, there are many books to write, to solve, to, to, to deal with that. I've struggled all my life with those questions, and I don't have an answer. I mean, I'll say one thing. I mean, one of the things that I'm not sure my book is entirely original in this, but one of the things that probably differentiates it from many others is the extent to which I've drawn on Caribbean and Latin American slavery literature in sort of as, as a way of informing my understanding of New Jersey slavery. So that's one part is that I'm continuously aware of how much less different the United States is from those cultures than often is, is marked. Um, I think the, the question of the difference between North and South around slavery, which is the second question you raise, is a um, I think is an open question. I, I guess the histor history as I understand it today would mark the difference between North and South less sharply than once was the case. And I think my book contributes to the less sharp differentiation, no longer to mark a free no North and an enslaved South. Um, the, a more important way of framing it is that commercial interests in Boston and New York and in Philadelphia um, were um, entirely committed to the maintenance of Southern slavery. Um, you know, the early factories, uh, the, the shoe factories of uh, New England that are marked as the sort of triumph of free labor were producing shoes for ensl enslaved people and they were producing what were called Negro shoes or slave shoes in large numbers. So that, and the um, commercial interests of New York were, were, under, um, were, were the central funding source for um, Southern planter interest. So in all those ways, the boundaries between North and South are certainly at the level of economics and material conditions much less sharply drawn than one uh, than one would have uh, once, than, than the historiography would have once have, have uh, noticed. Um, the, the underlying thrust of your question about the lingering significance of this history of slavery for how we live today strikes me as a question that, you know, in a sense, it goes beyond what a historian uh, can say much about, except that it. I, I experience it all the time. I agree with you um, that it's something that needs to be confronted. Whether it is whether one should mark the continuity with slavery or with the failure of emancipation after slavery strikes me as the deep political question that I, I, I think needs needs further attention. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to um, ask you a question about the anti-slavery societies in the North, um, specifically, like, for example, up in upstate New York, yeah. Garrett Smith, who was very wealthy when his, his organizations, they were able to um, purchase the liberty of, of many uh, slaves up North, people who, yes. who were in bondage. Um, my question is, um, how much... I mean, 
what percentage of slaves were purchased by the wealthy anti-slave, well, the anti-slavery movement, and and um, what effect did that have uh, the anti-slavery movement of the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s have on those who were who who were owning slaves? I mean, did they see that? the time for them to own slaves in the North was coming to an end. I, I know that that's what your talk was about, but but um, uh, I guess that's my question is, what was the percentage of, of peoples who were liberated from these anti-slavery societies in the North from? So actually, as far as I know, a, a question that we don't have the answer to. It's a, it's, we should. That is, I, my in, intuition is that the numbers who are actually freed through abolitionist societies is relatively small. Um, now, the legal culture does change. The presence of a free black community, free black communities in New York and Philadelphia, in the case of New Jersey, um, makes it relatively easy to disappear into those thick free black communities um, looking at the, at the New Jersey story. I still, one of the mysteries that I have, did not find an answer is how to explain the decline in the population of enslaved people in a state like New Jersey. Um, I, I can explain pieces of it. It's clear that a lot of, a, a lot, some part of it was, were manumissions which were, would have been shaped by these humanitarian manumission societies, by the change in the culture which made owning slaves both um, you know, sort of not a good thing if you were a right-minded uh, Christian to do, um, and which also uh, probably led to the decline in the price of the slaves. So the, 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 the conjuncture of price and moral sentiment I'm pretty cynical, so I'm sorry, you'll have to forgive that, um, uh, you know, went together. Um, some significant portion of the enslaved people all through the North were shipped south. Some significant, we don't know the numbers because it was, for the most part, ha illegal, so it had to be done surreptitiously. Um, but the incentives were enormous in part because of the end after 1808 of the international slave trade. Um, more because Britain, be, the British Navy began to enforce uh, constraints on the international slave trade than the co constitution's constraint on the international slave trade. That um, ironically happens at exactly the moment when there is a sugar boom in Louisiana and, there's the develop, and, and cotton becomes increasingly in demand. So that the demand for northern slaves um, goes skyrockets. So that if you can get, you know, the, the incentives to, to basically to kidnap black people from the north and move them south um, becomes very high. Um, but the numbers are very hard to... Uh, tell um, my colleague Rebecca Scott, who teaches at the University of Michigan, and I, who she's a wonderful historian of 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 um, black white relations and particularly black communities in Louisiana, um, and we've we've noticed the same names because there were actually family connections between New Jersey and. Um, and and uh, Louisiana, and so we're we're sort of slowly putting together a research project trying to track at least a few individuals. We'll never know the full numbers, but at least that we can track the processes through which um, people were, you know, fundamentally kidnapped uh, to, to the and even when and and the irony is that some of them were actually not slaves anymore. Because if they were ch children born after 1804, they weren't supposed to be slaves anymore. But presumably, if they got to Louisiana, nobody in Louisiana, no white in Louisiana, cared that these were not slaves any longer. 
And, and um, until the Union Army arrived in the 1860s, they would have served as slaves on, on slave plantations. I'm sorry, <laughs> you wanted a better story than that. <laughs> yes. Quick question about contracts, and I'm struck by how your story both tells a, 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 a story about how contracts and the law of contracts, of course, make slavery possible. You can't trade in property unless you have agreements about it and figure out the legitimate agreements and the non-legitimate agreements and enforce them. And then when you get to the section of post-1812, where enslaved people in New Jersey consent to being shipped down to Louisiana, I'm struck by the fact that I thought enslaved people lacked contractual capacity. So did the statute just say we carve out from the general lack of capacity that comes with being enslaved this one capacity, which is the capacity to basically sell yourself down yeah. river, and then a related contract is marriage, of course, because yes. part of... They, they, they copied the marriage, they, 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 they copied the separate examination in marriage cases okay. for, and, and applied it to slaves. So could you say just a couple words sure. about what the separate examination, so when could enslaved people in New Jersey get married? Well, the, actually from the 1780s on, from the beginning of statehood, the, the, um, marriage is always, ex the right of enslaved people to marry was always uh, allowed. One could say that if you look, I mean, or as I understand the legislative record in a state like New Jersey, yeah. um, it was a series of compromises. Right. Basically, in 1798, they enacted a slave code. Sounds just like, and it actually not that different from Latin American slave codes, a sort of <laughs> systematic, um, and you can read through it, and many of them are basically gifts to, uh, most of it is a gift to pro-slavery interests or yeah. the interests of those who would own slaves. But you can see small uh, concessions to uh, Quaker interests and to anti-slavery interests. The right to marry was one. There is a totally unenforceable um, right to, uh, of, of an enslaved person to be free from a, abuse. Um, there is a right um, uh, it, the, ostensibly Every slaveholder has a duty to teach his slaves to read. And so, is there any case law about the enforcement of any of those? An enslaved person who says, hey, I'm supposed to be able to get married and I'm not being no allowed to be married? No one ever stopped slaves from marrying. But of course, huh. the, the control, the power of the slaveholder would have meant, made that, the, the actual power would have had immense significance. But I never see a constraint on marriage. Uh, not a formal one. Uh, not a formal one. Um, the reading, the only time I, I looked systematically uh, through lots and lots of deeds and transactions where slaves are being sold to another master, um, there are a couple of moments in the Princeton archives where I found um, a, a, the, the seller saying, you, you need to teach. John to right. read. Right. Uh, now, That's a delegation of the duty. Yes. Did anybody pay any attention? Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that I learned in reading this material is how ubiquitous illiteracy is among whites as well. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the Quakers may have said you should teach your slaves to read, but if you did, weren't a very good reader. Right. <laughs> It, would, it meant a lot less than it would have meant otherwise. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm violating. The... Other questions? Yeah. Is there time for one more question? Uh, you mentioned uh, in your talk that uh, Joseph Hornblower was part of a constitutional convention that considered uh, the total ab abolition of yes. slavery in New Jersey. I'm curious, when was that, and what were the political forces in the state uh, and how? Uh, that were in favor of continuing some slavery as uh, opposed to the ones uh, trying to end it? How balanced were they? 
I th in, in part, his, he was writing, well, the Constitutional Convention is one, basically all through, um, all through the United States, north and south, um, in the in 1840s, new state constitutions are being enacted. This is largely a response to Jacksonian democracy. It's about the undoing of traditional property constraints on voting. It's, um, it's about the construction of um, a, something that's more, a more familiar court structure. So there's a variety of institutional reforms that uh, it's about the rise of corporations and banks and the sort of creation of, of, of um, elimination of what was called traditional special legislation practices. Um, New Jersey, like many states, borrows from the Bill of Rights and enacts a Declaration of Rights at the front of it. Um, and I think some people thought this meant if all men are free and equal, which is, I think, what, the, what uh, Article 1 of the Declaration of Rights in the New Jersey Constitution says, that that inherently meant the end of slavery. Um, and, you know, Hornblower, that's Hornblower's argument, as you call, call it, the left or the uh, liberal Protestant um, argument. Um, but the majority says, you know, that's not what, what it was intended. And, you know, no more than our Declaration of Independence was intended to free slaves in 1776. Um, so it wasn't actually proposed as in the Maryland Constitutional Convention of 1864, yes. uh, before the 13th Amendment, yes. where they made a, a specific proposal to... Uh, as far as I know, not. I but um, I don't want to pretend that I you know sure. everything. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned those uh, freed black communities there. Did they have any role to play in this gradual emancipation? Oh, they played an incredibly important role. First of all, as um, an attractive, as a, as an attractive place for enslaved people to disappear into, right? Um, so that, um, so they sense, had safe haven. Yeah. So yeah. So it also it meant that, um, you know, it, it played an important role in the declining price of slaves. Yeah, I noticed that twenty dollars for one of the slaves. I was amazed. Yeah. Um, you know. So you know. So prices decline. Um, in part because it's harder to hold on to it. I, I, one, could, one could imagine further that as gradual emancipation becomes the norm, in a sense, if you want to hold, if, if, you're, if you are a rational slaveholder <laughs> and you want the use of your labor, you, you will need to negotiate. Um, and so I think those communities play an important role. Now, um, there's um, Sarah Groningsatter has been writing a history of the uh, of, um, of emancipation in uh, New York, which is very different from New Jersey because it has a much more powerful, both has a much more politically active black community and because it has a continuing manumission society that, that plays a white elite manumission society that plays how, how does she spell that last name? Groning, G R O N N I N G S A T E R. Right. <laughs> I think I got it right. Um, okay. but anyway, she um, and one of the things that she you know the core thing that the free black community in New York does in her rendition along with these elite whites who will help fund it is create schools for black children. Oh, okay. Which really don't exist in New Jersey or in much of the Northeast. Is uh, that so? Until, you know, in part, but I mean, there is a Philadelphia school for colored children, but these cities become, basically the cities where there is, you know, enough people, enough resources, some, 
uh, some black people who become middle class and can play a continuing political role, um, wards of the city that uh, will have, you know, you know, that basically people need the votes, <laughs> and so that, that changes the, the politics of it, which doesn't mean that there still is an incredible racism and violence and uh, yeah. all through it, but, but there's some um, security in numbers that's different than, than in a place like New Jersey where the black population is highly scattered, it's located in households, it's without, um, okay. without those kinds of resources. Okay. Well, help? thank you very much. Sure. I appreciate that. Should we stop? Okay, I've, I've been told to cut it off. Thank you all very much. <laughs>